Uh, let's go right into this powerful interview with Mario Murillo. It's life-changing. This is a man who has unlocked his story. And oh my gosh, miracles. You're going to see them video tape miracles. You'll see the testimony of living proof that Jesus is moving in America. Strap yourself in, ladies and gentlemen. I've got Mario Murillo with me in the house. And uh, we're just going to, we're going to dive right in because we are seeing, everybody talks about great awakening and move of God, but I'll tell you what, we're actually seeing it, Mario. We're seeing right. Last night, right down here in uh, Dallas, I found out you were in my neighborhood. And I said, hey, man, you're going to be here with, at a minister's conference. Mm -hmm. But who expected that? I mean, we've got a faith ministry conference, but there was at least, there was numerous supernatural healings that happened right. last night. And, I, and they all kind of fall into a certain pattern of um, you seeing the person. They don't know who you are. You start getting words of knowledge about what's going on with their their body, their pain, their their history, their problem, and but while you're describing it, the healing's already happening. I mean, is this? Do you ever get tired of this? Or ever? <laughs> I, I, it's a dumb question. I mean, but if for you, it's as common as me doing podcasts. I mean, you, you, this is beautiful. Well, it, it is amazing, and it's never anything but terrifyingly wonderful. So. Every night when I go through this process, it's like the first time. It's like the first time. And then when I see it, it's like it never happened before, and I never get used to it. I see that in you. I mean, yeah. we, just, we just played. We got some for you. We just saw for the first time some editing that just our staff did. This could be, this could be done a hundred times, but we just grabbed two miracles and interviewed the people and then spl and then Chelsea put it together with the with the moment it happened. So you see the interview person saying this is what happened right. to me and then it cuts back to the moment. Uh, let, let's go to one of those video clips right on early in this broadcast. I want people to see what I'm talking about. These are the events that we are inviting you to. I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. The faith of the Son of God. Say it out loud. If you rely on your power to believe for your healing, you're going to stay sick. If you surrender to the Holy Spirit right now and allow the faith of Jesus to be imparted to you, you'll be healed. Tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Nancy. I'm from Wymoma, Florida. I had scarred lungs from H1N1 where I was on death's door in ICU for 10 days. Some of you wonder what's going on in this room. How do I know the things that I know during a meeting? Because you are receiving faith. The Bible says that when you're preaching the gospel, you're scattering seed. And some of it falls on good ground, some on hard ground. But the fact remains, Listen to me, that when that seed falls into this woman down here, all of a sudden, her lungs are gonna open up. They said my lungs would never recover. You know who I'm talking about. I'm looking right at you, and both of your lungs are starting to open up right now, and they have been locked almost shut, and at night, you suffocate because you can't breathe, and it's open. And I use oxygen at nighttime, but uh, Mario brought me up. Get out of your seat and come to the aisle. Somebody give God the glory. It's been years. I've never met this woman, but I want all of you to know something, dear. It's been years. It's been well over 12 years that you've had this, and it's gone, and it's not coming back. My lungs really feel like I'm 20 years old. I can breathe all the way down here, which I could never do, and I know I'm. my lungs are healed. Doesn't that feel wonderful? Somebody can have my oxygen machine because I don't need it. You just take a deep breath for us. 
Praise the Lord. Praise God. It's wow. been wonderful. Wow. Now, do you remember that? Yes, vividly. Okay, so what was going on? What was going on is that you, you're out there, and as I said, you, you know, you're preaching and you're scattering seed. And in Acts, the book of Acts, Paul was at Lystra and he saw a man who had never walked. And it said that Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. Yep. Well, that, that eyesight to see that is uh, the word of knowledge. He saw it. And then he said with a loud voice, stand up. And the man got up and walked, was instantly healed. The same thing happened right there. This woman heard what I said, obeyed what I said, and received faith. And I looked out, and at the moment she received faith, the Lord turned my attention to her face. Then I said, please, stand up. It's your lungs, isn't it? I didn't know what was wrong with her until after she had received faith. Then when I knew, it was all happening at the same time. And it's a remarkable, uh, terrifying, as I, I keep using that word, but you walk in the fear of God when something like that happens, especially when it's so public. And this is what a lot of people don't understand is that we're so used to miracles being done secretly or we want to hide them from the general public or we eschew the glare of the skeptical science community. But it's what Paul said to Agrippa. He said, these things were not done in a corner. Day of Pentecost was very public. And I think that what we're watching now is a moment where God has decided, I'm going to demonstrate my power publicly because the problem in America is beyond words. Our, our addictions are beyond the ability of being talked out of them. Our perversion is such that words aren't going to do it. And our defense of the gospel in America is such that now, because there's so much demonic activity, the only thing that's going to get through to the people we're trying to reach now is the power of God. So without doubt, when you're preaching, I'm always amazed that uh, you could have multiple altar calls. I remember one night we, you had an altar call and it was hundreds of people came forward. And then I thought, I can't believe he just, he just got done preaching. He's going for the, did he forget he just did an altar call? And a, and a larger harvest came. What's going on in a meeting like that? See, it, it, what's going on in that meeting, Lance, is what's going on in America. And I want people watching to understand this. Evil has exalted itself in America. What used to be unmentionable in the marketplace, the back alley and the smoke-filled rooms is now out. That's, that language is now out in the open. The perversion's out in the open. And it, I believe it's forced the hand of God. God's hand has been forced. And it's a blessing and it's a very frightening thing because what it means is, is that God is saying, I'm going to save America. I'm going to save America by healing the sick. And, you know, one of the criticisms that I get is they say, well, if God was real, why wouldn't you go down and empty a hospital ward? And I looked at him and I smile and I said, well, what would you do if that happened? Because it's likely that we are entering a time that's reminiscent of when the, the apostles were on the earth. And we're entering a time where God could heal in mass. Now, we've been protected from that because our missionary evangelists have seen it in the third world. You know, T.L. Osborne and, and Reinhard Bonnke, and they've seen it in mass healings. But what happens if it starts happening in America? Right. It's because God wants to save this country. And we talk about persecution, Opposition, yes, we see evil is becoming militant. If it's militant out of the closet in its, in its um, propagation, it'll be militant in its agitation that yes. it's being rebuked. Yes. So on the same day, chapter 8 of the book of Acts, you just said it. We're coming back to those book of Acts days. On that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. So here we have a regional sphere where the persecution breaks out. They were scattered abroad except the apostles. 
Saul's ravaging the church, going into house after house. Therefore, those who had been scattered went preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria, a different region, different city, different spiritual story. He preaches the word. I think about you when I read this. Philip went to the Samaria, to Samaria began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds, crowds, with one accord, there was no disunity in the crowd, were giving attention to what was said as they heard and saw the signs which were being performed, which is why you call your ministry Living Proof. Right. They see the signs, and, and we're going to have more videos we're going to be doing, because we're looking at these videos and going, the videos tell a story. Media is so powerful, because the miracle can happen at the tent. Mercedes has been there, and she said, and she's a really bright millennial, and she thinks like a businesswoman. She right. thinks she runs the operation. She said, it messes with your head. She said, it just... When you see God come down and just miraculously just dance through the congregation and pick out a few people and they get a miracle, it just, there's, there's no, a person who's never lived in that. We're almost too familiar with faith teaching, a lot of my audience too. When you're new to this and you go, what in the world? I believe in Jesus, but I've never seen this. Well, then, well, then watch what happens. The, uh, with one accord, they gave attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw signs he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits that were coming out with shouting with a loud voice, many paralyzed and lame were healed. And so here's the deal. There was much rejoicing in the city in a place where there could be economic deprivation, fentanyl, depression, suicide, crime, darkness. God gives a prescription, Mario. You've had it your whole life. Absolutely. And suddenly joy breaks out in the homeless camp. Yep. And And you see, that's why I believe that what what our crusades are doing by picking the worst places, going, uh, you know, not always are we in the worst places. We're doing um, a crusade we're going to talk about in Colorado Springs. But we'll go in California right beside a homeless camp, right where the most violent gangs are operating. And the Lord will say, put up your tent. On that property right there, that abandoned piece of property, put your tent up, get your workers in here, and watch the power of God work. So we've seen the word of knowledge operate. One example, a woman is in the homeless camp. You know, folks, we believe that everyone who's homeless must have done something wrong to get homeless. It's not always the case. The stories are very complicated layers and layers of things that happened. This particular woman came home from work, walked in her house, and four of her family members were there murdered. They were dead. She didn't know why anyone killed them. They were not there. She just, and she turned on her heels and ran, ended up homeless. Never figured out, the police never figured out the motive, never figured out who was after her, but she believed. And the other thing we don't know about being in a homeless camp is you get sick. You're exposed to bacteria, you're exposed to viruses, you're exposed to uh, the elements. And she was a middle-class woman now in a camp. And someone had handed her a card because when we go to the the biggest problem we face, when we bring in the, the homeless, they don't want to leave their stuff. So at night is the most vulnerable. They have to take a step of faith to come. She came. She's sitting on the side. uh, And I walked into the tent and the Holy Spirit said, this woman has this in her kidneys, her back, legs, etc. But most of all, God said she has fear. I didn't understand that she wasn't a Christian. So I turn around and I look at her. And sure enough, I saw fear like I've never seen in my life. This woman was absolutely beside herself with terror. She was living in terror. And the word came, kidneys, lungs, heart, spine, all healed, but she saved. This is the crazy part. She was saved. She She wasn't a Christian when God healed her. And, you know, we were with Bob Yandian last night, and he said something amazing. He said, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says Jesus performed all these miracles, and because the people that were healed saw were healed, they believed. 
So there it was. They weren't believers until after they were healed. More than half of the youth that are healed in our tent aren't Christians when at the moment of their healing. So what you're saying is not only true, it's vital that we get it out. God is on the move. The Spirit of God is working in America. The media isn't covering it, but right now maybe that's a good thing. Well, yeah, because as we know, by the time the media does cover it, it's typically because it's a controversy. And we're trying to, we're, we're, we're not trying to pick a fight with anyone, but the devil knows we're there. Right. So Colorado Springs, I'm finding, I'm, people are sending me blogs of um, the, polit- the politicians are complaining about evangelism. They're worried the power of God's going to show up in Colorado Springs and interrupt their kingdom. And I'm getting these weird uh, from this is from uh, like I'll be honest with you, it's a Democratic Party. Republicans are asleep. They don't even I don't even know if they they know what's happening. Democrats know what's going on because they're they're putting high alert out that uh, we're coming to Colorado Springs. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with them? Don't they want to see people healed? Don't they want to see people minister to? Evidently, we're a threat. So uh, it's a spiritual thing. And we you guys got to get out to Colorado Springs because that'll be the next the next combination of right. what you're doing and what I'm doing, which right. is uh, exciting. The dates for that are going to be July 16th through the 19th. And we're going to do at 10 o'clock in the morning, fire and glory, 630 at night, the living proof crusade. And uh, we do need people to register to come because it's going to change your life. One of the questions I got is, well, do those who are opposing us believe the miracles aren't real? You notice they're not saying that. They're saying... uh, you know, this is what's coming, and we gotta we got to oppose it. And it's interesting that they're not denying the reality of the miracles. It's, it's absolutely true. They're not, isn't that curious? They're not trying to cast uh, questions on the credibility of what's happening. They're saying the message is a problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's evil, right? Because what it means is the only reason we're opposing it is because we're going to lose our power. They're worried Our about influence. the Listen, folks, it's for those of you on the podcast, it's fireandglorytour.com. Fireandglorytour.com. You need to register. You need to get there. I'd say the, the tent fills up before the meeting starts. And Mario, uh, he's a peculiar cat. What he'll do is he'll start the meeting early. If the people are hungry and the tent's full, why delay? And it's like, boom, you know? So the, the tra- that, that train goes when uh, as the spirit moves. And so you want to get there for this register. Now, I was surprised. I met with some pastors. We had a meeting with 400 business leaders and pastors. Um, All kinds of very great leaders are involved with this. Two great churches are working together. They're going to have combined services, aren't they? Right. The the thing that I want to say is, I said, well, we're going to have 50 churches. They said more like maybe 25. Now, the I made this comment the other night in a broadcast that the churches are not in unity in Colorado. You would think that, you know, we're not going, this is at our expense. We're not building a ministry in Colorado. We're coming, no. we're putting our money in to do something for a place. We're not getting something out of it, uh, except for the glory of God is coming out of it. And I'm saying, why do you only have 25 churches? Well, they, they've they really been broken up a lot, but people are writing down in their notes something which um, you would correct me on, I'm sure, and you'd be right to do so. The churches aren't signing up, but their people are. So the leaders aren't in unity in Colorado Springs, but the church is in unity. The leaders are dysfunctional, but the church is waiting for a move of God, and they're the ones signing up. So I got corrected last night. A number of people said, oh, we're we're signing up. Forget it, but don't don't worry about the pastor. We are the church. And what the devil forgets about persecution And I I really want to look in the camera and tell you this. The thing that stops Christians is also the thing that starts Christians. And what stops us is the public reaction, the public uh, inability to say, you know, what we need to do here is be quiet because we're going to lose members. We're not, the media is going to hate us. Right. But there's a tipping point where all of a sudden, it's, a, it's about the kids, our children. They're, they're trying to remove Christ from our community, and they're using the children. Then yeah. it becomes activism, and believers become 
absolutely activated. Now, what Mario's saying here is is part of, uh, I, you know, and people say you're an evangelist because I know we could talk about the other side of this is you're really calling out with great discerning where the true and the and the fault line of the the false prophetic is in danger because it's got, this is only going to get more exaggerated and confusing going into the next election. The left is going to manifest. There's going to be persecution right. against the, everything. And then the prophetics is going to be flying. They can't help it. It's, everyone's going to have an opinion. And you're early on drawing a line there. And I, and I so respect that. But I, I'm only bringing that up to say that you're, you're more than an evangelist, in my opinion, because the argument the prophets will go is, well, Mario has his opinion. He's an evangelist. You're, I think we ought to recognize that a lot of the calls in the body of Christ are hybrid calls. And uh, so you see the pastor evangelist. So what happens? The guy stopped being an evangelist when he started a church? Did John Osteen just say, now he's Pastor John? But well, may, well, maybe he's an apostle and he's done the work of an evangelist and he's also a teacher. So there's a lot of things we don't understand about callings. But I will tell you this, when you were on Flashpoint uh, and uh, it was a largely prophetically driven narrative trying to figure out and intuit what's going on in the chaos of the Trump era, you had as much prophetic insight in clarifying current events as anyone we had that calls himself, calls himself prophet, whether it's Hank or me or anyone else. I think you're really a prophet evangelist. I think Finney was a prophet evangelist because he was highly intuitive on discerning both people, culture, climate, what region to go into. And uh, his intercession life was supernatural. I mean, he, he was the intercessor preacher. And yeah. I find a lot of prophetic people tend to move easier into the Chuck Pierce will say that the intercessor and the prophetic tend to flow together very well. Right. But I do believe that people don't get the fact that you're prophetic. And so when you talk about the trends of what's happening in America, I think it's because the prophet in you is giving you a guidance missile for your evangelist wow. call so that you're hitting exactly where the evangelism is. And I just want to, I just want to declare that because it bothers me that we want to categorize like Mara's an evangelist, Lance, you're a teacher, blah, blah. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that. It sure so, is. So, you know, when yeah. Daniel's in Babylon, he's actually prophet, not teacher. And when Daniel is teaching, he could be the prophetic teacher. So I got a different kind of hybrid call. That's why I can recognize the hybrid call on you. But America is at a tipping point. And what he said that many missed is that he had written this, an, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, you said, in a blog that the Pride Month would be the tipping point. And it's amazing that during this month of pride, when you've got Budweiser and you've got uh, you, you got your various other pushbacks happening with Disney and places where the where people are target pushing back on the woke agenda, right. it's the coming for your kids. We're queer. We're here. We're coming for your children. We're coming for your kids. That has been a line too far. The devil, in a sense, has overstepped as he often does. But you picked up on it. This is actually a tipping point. And I do believe that the evangelism work, the rally work is going to tie into something that's going to be for the families because Satan's going after your children and he's unmasked and said, I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm going for your kids. And now it's like now the awake, the root awakening is happening. Somehow that's where the fire and glory links up with the living proof. And so where I work on the legislative and the mobilization and the, the Nehemiah anointing of rebuilding the walls of the city and mobilizing the business people and the politicians for a move, you're actually breaking open like a battering ram, the spirit realm, knocking the devil back out of the territory and um, releasing signs and wonders like Samaria so that something can be built. And that's why, you know, what happens... Is there something when I minister, there's something when you minister, but there's something else that's greater than the sum of its parts when you and I get together, because you also have a multiple gift. And this is going to sound like a mutual admiration society, <laughs> but, but it needs to be said. Revivals have come to America through voices like Finney and Whitfield and Billy Graham. People don't really remember Billy Graham properly, but I, I got to say this directly. There is a there is a reformation evangelistic tone that comes on you when you get in the fire and glory setting. 
and I, I, I still believe in your whiteboard, and I, I believe it's a necessary uh, artifact, uh, not an artifact, equipment. Accessory. Yes, and, and it's very helpful. But what happened when we did the first Fire and Glory and you got up on a Sunday morning, something came on you that people are still watching. It's one of the most watched videos we have mm. in our uh, library is you began to declare that America needs to turn back to God. So at Fire and Glory, people are going to get something very, very important. We all know that we're conservatives. We all know that we have a certain individual we wish would win the election. But what we don't have at this point is the clear path to victory that comes through a moral awakening in the country. That's what fire and glory provides Ooh. that does not come from these other events. And then you throw on top of that the miracles at night. Glory, this glory. This is an amazing so moment. You know, and, and folks, what you're watching right now is what I, I live for. And that's the moments when the Holy Spirit speaks through Mario so that I can hear it or that perhaps the Spirit will speak through me so that he can hear it. Because what we need now are teams real teams of ministries that work in unity with, with Jesus. God is looking for that model. And what you said is there really is no blueprint for a moral awakening. And this is the distinction. We talk about this, but for those that are all aware of the, the controversies that we're involved with, the distinction between the prophetic voice that produces an awakening that shifts a culture and the prophetic voices that produces sensationalism that builds an audience is whether or not it pierces the conscience and produces conviction so that the believers, Look out. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So, you know, you read Daniel's breakthrough intercession as the angel's about to go to work and raise up Cyrus. And his breakthrough intercession was, oh God, you've seen the wickedness of Nebuchadnezzar, how they've stolen from us. They've been, I lost my, I, even, I was even emasculated myself. He didn't play the victim card because of what the left had done to his country. He said, I and my fathers have sinned. This has happened, and we have a role to play in being accountable for it. Therefore, forgive. Lord God, forgive. His intercession, and here's a man who, to my, to my knowledge, could have been the biggest victim card player in the world, a kid who gets castrated to go serve as a eunuch in another guy's government. And he has no bitterness. He resigns himself to the fact that this is what God's plan and God's favor and God's purpose will be upon me yet. So Daniel, the intercessor, actually identifies with the failure of the church in his day to guard, the, guard Israel. He identifies more with Jeremiah, the frustrated prophet, than anything. And he prays in such a way that he produces an intervention of God. If our preaching isn't producing a conviction upon the church, it's not prophetic. Well, you know, and uh, that is so important what you just said is so dynamically important and nails it that I know there are people watching that are discerning what we're saying. Because you see, there's a, there, there's a large group of Christians that don't understand why we aren't being more effective in winning the culture war. And the, the term I want to bring up is the term cutting edge. All right, cutting edge, when that term is uh, referenced it's usually not correct it's not an accurate description we say well that person is cutting edge we mean they're avant-garde they're in the front they're trendy they're uh they're right. illuminated but it isn't that at all cutting edge literally refers to the sharpness of the tool oh. and its ability to cut it's not perception it's it's impact well, cutting edge is mentioned in the Bible this way. It says where the ax is sharp, not much force is needed. And what we aren't and doing... And wisdom is profitable to direct. Right. My director is saying, I'm loving this show so much. We're going a minute over. Can you speak to that camera right now? Remember, it's going to be Fire and Glory Tour. And also, you're, we're going to talk in the next show about the L.A. fairgrounds because you're, you're, you're on fire all over the place but would you just pray for the folks out there? Because I know they're deserting what we're saying. And I want you to catch both broadcasts, this and the next one. Lord Jesus, I thank you for everyone. Nobody is watching this accidentally. 
And Lord, this is an hour and a moment where your power needs to be released on the average Christian who needs to understand there's no such thing as an average Christian. Every one of us are a weapon in the hand of God. And there is a reason that we come into knowledge and power. And let them, Lord, overcome and be filled with light and power and be set free and healed in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Mario Murillo. We're gonna, we're, I'm going to follow this up with another uh, interview. And you guys have to wait a week to see it on Daystar, but uh, my podcast group will get it right away because I want to go into part two immediately. God bless you. We'll see you again.